Hello, this is Paranormal Girl and today I'm going to talk to you about the Smurls from the Warrens case files. The home of Jack and Janet Smurl in West Pittston, Pennsylvania was the scene of an horrific and terrifying haunting from 1985 to 1987. The case received wide attention in the media Although the house went through three exorcisms and investigations by the demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren, the demon refused to leave. The hauntings were chronicled in a book and portrayed in a movie both named The Haunted. The house involved is a duplex built in 1896 on a quiet street in the middle class neighbourhood. After Hurricane Agnes flooded much of northeastern Pennsylvania in 1972, the Smurl family was forced to leave their home in Wilkes Bar. Jack's parents, John and Mary Smurl, bought the house in West Pinston in 1973 for $18,000. They lived in the right half, and Jack and Janet and their two first two daughters, Dawn and Heather, moved into the left half. The Smurls spent much of their time and money redecorating and remodeling, doing much of the work themselves. The Smurls say they were a close and loving family. Both Jack and Janet grew up in an area meeting in 1967 and marrying in 1968. Jack served in the Navy, becoming a neuropsychiatric technician. Both the Smurls were raised in a Catholic homes with strong religious beliefs. They enjoyed living with Jack's parents and had no trouble sharing the duplex with them. First 18 months on Chase Street were the happy ones. But strange things began to occur after that. In January 1974, a strange stain appeared on a new carpet and Jack's television set burst into flames. Water pipes leaked, even after repeated resoldering. The new sink and bathtub in the remodelled bathroom were found severely scratched, as if a wild animal had clawed at them. Freshly painted woodwork in the bathroom also showed similar scratches. And in 1975, their oldest daughter Dawn repeatedly saw people floating around her bedroom. By 1977, the Smurls realised their house was in some way spooked. The toilets flushed without anyone using them. Footsteps would continuously be heard on the stairs. Drawers would open and close on their own accord. Radios would blare, although they were unplugged. And empty rocking chairs would mysteriously rock and creak as if someone was actually sitting in them. As time went on, they began to smell sour and vile smells throughout the house. On several occasions, Jack felt the touch of an unseen hand caress him. By now, there were two more smell smells, twins Shannon and Karen, and the family were growing frustrated and fatigued by the increasing phenomenon. And this is how poltergeist activity begins. Um, it usually starts off with tapping, knocking and scratching. You may get the occasional noise of uh, a toilet flushing. And then things start to begin to escalate. Um, like you'll see objects moving like they did with the rocking chair. Drawers begin to open. So it starts escalating its activity just to get the attention. This is how it starts. Once it knows the family is aware of it and is frightened, then it will go into the next stage. And this will be explained a little further on uh, into this, uh, this case. In 1985, what had started at annoying disturbances became frightening experiences. And this is what they do. Start off with something small. And then if you don't pay any attention, it will escalate. And this is where it gets quite frightening. The house now often became ice cold. And again, ice cold is another sign of some presence within your home, be it spiritual or demonic. Always, you will always feel 
cold spot. John and Mary heard loud, abusive and obscene language coming from Jack and Janet's side of the house, although Jack and Janet were not even arguing. Again, they use, it will mimic, um, especially something evil will always mimic um, people's voices. Uh, you might hear a member of your family calling you, always uh, using your name. But you'll always find they're never there. In February 1985, Janet heard her name being called whilst in the basement doing laundry. After searching for the unseen caller, she realised she'd been alone the entire time. And again, this is how they do this. Two days later, icy cold again was felt in the house, but this time a black human-shaped form with no facial features appeared to Janet in the kitchen. It de- sorry, it dematerialized through the wall and appeared to Mary on the opposite side of the house. From that point on, the haunting activity increased in both frequency and magnitude. Again, it's showing itself. Once it starts showing itself, then you've got a problem. A large ceiling fan crashed down inches from Shannon, nearly killing her. On the night of her now 13-year-old sister Heather was to be confirmed into the Catholic religion. As activity increased, Jack and Janet had on occasion levitated. Janet was violently pulled off of her bed after making love with her husband, while he lay paralysed gagging from a foul odour. Family's German shepherd, Simon, was repeatedly picked up and thrown. Terrible rapping and scratching noises were continuously heard in the walls. Now you see it's escalating. One night while sleeping, Shannon was tossed out of bed and down the stairs. Even neighbours were not spared. Several heard screams and strange noises coming from the house when the Smills were not even home. Most of the neighbours were sympathetic as the Smills vowed to fight. And this is what you must do if you're in this position. Family must stay together because the love of a family will actually help fight the demonic presence. You have to stay strong and this is one thing you need to do. Bear in mind. And show no fear. In January 1986, Janet heard about Ed and Lorraine Warren, physical researchers and demonologists from Monroe, Connecticut. Although sceptical but having nowhere else to turn, she called the Warrens. The Warrens arrived shortly thereafter, accompanied by Rosie Frewer, Frewer, a registered nurse and psychic. They began the investigation by quizzing the Smills carefully about their religious beliefs the happiness of the family life and whether they had ever practiced satanism occultism or used a ouija board in any way that was to invite supernatural into their home and they always say when you do use uh, occultism or ouija boards it opens a portal again satanism is another thing as well um you start dabbling in the dark arts and you'll open Something that you cannot send back. And then you've, you've got a problem. This is why they always say do not, absolutely do not dabble in the dark arts or use Ouija boards. Because you, you just don't know what you're doing. Then the Warrens and Frewer walked through the house identifying the bedroom closet as the crossover point between the two sides of the duplex team said that they had detected the presence of four evil spirits. Three were minor, but the fourth was a demon. Without any evidence of family dysfunction, occult, invitation or tragedy, the Warrens could only surmise that the demon must have been dormant, probably for decades, and had risen to draw on the emotional energy generated by the girl's entrance to puberty. And you'll always find this with paranormal activity when a child reaches puberty be it a girl or a boy they generate a lot of energy that attracts the spirit world 
and sometimes then you'll get poltergeist activity. Again, there was a famous case of the Enfield poltergeist where the girls were um, entering into puberty and that's where things got quite frightening because they were generating an energy um, that these evil spirits were attracted to. The Warrens tried twice to provoke the demon to expose itself by playing tapes of religious music and confronting it with prayer. The demon reacted violently by shaking a mirror and dresser drawers and yet another instance by spelling out, you filthy bastard, get out of this house. Only holy water and prayer seemed to stop the manifestations. And again, when you use religious provocation, it always seems to work, especially the most powerful words you can possibly use, which are, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave. Always use these words. If you have any um, spiritual problems, this usually sends it back. And of course, if you've got holy water and a rosary, that adds ed added protection. The situation began to turn more serious as Jack was raped by a scaly succubus posing as an old woman with a young body. Her eyes were red and her gums were green. Ed Warren was choked and then began to suffer from terrible flu-like symptoms. An incubus sexually assaulted Janet and pig noises, a sign of serious demonic infestation, could be heard in the walls. And again, with the incubus and succubus. An incubus is normally, uh, they normally come in the, in the guise of a male and they'll always attack a female. A succubus will always uh, attack men and it'll always be of a female kind. The Smills said they tried several times to obtain support and action from the church. The Roman Catholic Diocese of Scranton said it would consult with experts but official involvement would be unlikely. At one point in time Janet thought she was getting help from a priest called Father O'Leary but discovered no such priest existed. Now, usually with the Vatican, they have to be, they have to give permission to the Roman Catholic Church to perform exorcisms. And it's only certain priests that uh, are well versed in the exorcist rite that are allowed to perform an exorcism. The Warrens brought in Father, now Bishop McKenna, a traditionalist priest who refused to abide by the changes in ritual mandated by the Second Vatican Council. He said Mass in Latin and performed more than 50 exorcisms for the Warrens. He conducted the ancient rite, which did nothing but infuriate the demon. Again, not always exorcisms um, work. They are a very dangerous practice and can only be used by a practiced priest. There was one other person that could perform exorcisms, and that was Ed Warren himself. The haunting continued. Daughter Karen fell seriously ill from a strange fever and nearly died, and Dawn was almost raped by the evil presence. Janet and Mary had slash marks and bites on their arms, and everyone was depressed. Ed Warren explained that they were in the second stage of demonic stage oppression, which follows infestation and is followed by possession and death. Bishop McKenna performed a second exorcism in late spring, but to no avail. The demon even accompanied the family on camping trips to Poconos and harassed Jack at work. The family now knew that they could not move to another house because the demon would just follow them. After repeated refusals by the church to help, the Smills decided to appear on television. Remaining anonymous behind a screen, they were interviewed by Richard Bay on a local Philadelphia show called People Are Talking. The demon retaliated. It levitated Janet and then hurled her against the wall. Later appeared to Jack as a monstrous creature resembling a pig on two legs. 
a human hand came up through the mattress and grabbed Janet by the back of the neck. And again, Jan Jack was raped. And again, have you always noticed that the demonic will always either appear as a pig with red eyes or another creature with red eyes? And that is always the sign of something very demonic, very dangerous. There was a famous case um, with a pig called Jody in the Amityville Horror that appeared to the little girl, again, with flaming red eyes. And that was demonic as well. Very, very dangerous. In August 1986, the Smills felt the risk of ridicule did not outweigh the need to tell this story to a wider audience and granted an interview to the Wilkes Bar Sunday Independent newspaper. Almost immediately, their home became a tourist attraction for the press, curious onlookers and sceptics who wished to investigate. Some sceptics, who included some of the Smills' neighbours, said they believed the family were concocting the story to profit from the book and movie contracts. The Smills contacted a medium, Mary Alice Rinkman, who examined the house and corroborated the Warren's findings of four spirits. She identified one as an old woman called Abigail and another as a dark mustachioed man called Patrick, who had murdered his wife and her lover and had been hung by the mob. She could not identify the third, but the fourth was a powerful demon. Press coverage finally pushed the Scranton Diocese into action and they offered to take over the investigation. The Warrens had also planned a mass exorcism with several priests. Prayer groups came to the house to give comfort. Bishop McKenna came the third time to exorcise the house and this time the ritual seemed to work. There were no disturbances for about three months. Shortly before Christmas in 1986, Jack again saw the black form beckoning him to the third stage of possession. Again, have you noticed a black form? Now it's making itself known again. This is what it does. If the tapping and the scratching and the knocking doesn't work, then it will start to escalate into forms. And this is how they, um, this is how the demonic actually, uh, work so I'll say that again shortly before Christmas in 1986 Jack again saw the black form beckoning him to the third stage of possession he clutched his rosary and prayed hoping this would simply was an isolated incident it was not the banging again started as well as the putrid smells and violent acts of aggression again demonic always follows with putrid smells of rotten flesh and acts of violent aggression you might hear bangings thumpings knockings rattlings and it is quite very very frightening for the people involved frustrated and tired and hopeless the smills moved to another town shortly before the release of a book concerning their ordeal called The Haunted. It went to press. The church performed a fourth exorcism in 1988, which finally seemed to have given them peace. A movie version of The Haunted was released in 1991. So now I'll explain something about demonic possession. Um, there are three stages of this that I will explain here on this page. It's critical to this story to know the three stages of possession. As most Ed and Lorraine Warren cases, demonic possessions can take over and ruin many lives. It is scary for those that encounters this beast, th these beasts in their full nature. But for those that are under possession, it's the scariest and most soul-crushing moment of their life. The three stages of possession are infestation, oppression, and full possession and I'll explain each and everyone here infestation 
are the little things that many people don't notice or try to deny. Some examples are sounds, eerie feelings, and the haunting feeling of always being watched. The feeling of being watched make us feel very unsettled. And when we do feel unsettled, we lose the sense of control. And this can be scary. You have no idea what may or where they are, maybe or where they are. But in this case, it's not as nice as rainbows, but as evil as hell. So it starts off with little taps, sounds, knocks that you think, oh, is that the house making the sounds? Is it the house settling? And you always brush these kind of things off. But then you get the feeling that you're not alone and you're being watched. You know the feeling when you feel the hairs on your back of your neck rise? Or you feel you might feel somebody coming up behind you and standing very close to you? Now that's a scary feeling. And how many of you have actually felt that? The next one is oppression. It's the weakest link in the household that becomes the specific, sorry, specific target of the upcoming attacks. In this case, it was the girl that was going through puberty. It'll always choose the weakest person in the family. And then the attacks will start. It could be as simple as being pushed down the stairs, being hit or scratched. In some cases, being poked and prodded. And then the demon showing its actual form. This is when they know they've got you scared. And this is when they'll start to appear to you. When they start doing that, this is when things get very, very frightening. To the targeted person, this is utterly terrifying. Nobody will believe you because every time you try and say you've seen something, they'll brush it off and think you're um, just, uh, it's, they'll just pass it off as a flight of fancy. And that you feel that you're left alone to fight the battle alone. And in most cases they are. This stage will continue until the soul, the faith and the hope are extinguished from that person. Till they feel absolutely helpless. That nobody is believing them. No one will help them. And they're all alone in fighting this battle. They'll even think they're going crazy. But they're not. And again, this means that they have to fight on their own, which leads to the third and final stage when all else fails and they're at a loss and the, the, the lowest ebb. This is when full possession of when the demon has full power and is capable of anything and everything. This is when they take possession of that victim because they've taken everything away from them. Now they're isolated and this is when they take full possession of that person. The selected person will have their soul and body taken over and that is the most dangerous part ever because the demon will then enter their body. It's tough to take the demon out of the person and this is where an exorcism has to be performed. It is very dangerous. Once that demon has entered that person, then the battle begins. The only step then is to take, is for a priest to take an exorcism, is to use an exorcism, sorry. And of course, in some cases, it's not just a single person being possessed, but the residents themselves. And there's been many, many cases. Uh, one of the most famous case was uh, the film called The Exorcism. Oh, sorry, The Exorcist, where uh, a girl was possessed by a demon. But in actual fact, in the real story, it was a young boy. And again, the priest had to come and perform an exorcism. It was a very, very dangerous practice. And some people have been known to die because of it. It is that dangerous. Very, very dangerous. So... What it actually comes down to, if you think you have a haunting in your house, get help. Find someone that can come into your home, be it a psychic or a clairvoyant. Ask them to bless your home. Normally this is done with sage. If it is something demonic, 
on something more powerful, then you need to turn to the church because only an exorcist can he either bless the house or perform an exorcism and clear the house. And again, the one thing that you must remember in dealing with evil entities, all the demonic, is keep the family together and the love, bring the love together because what the demon is trying to do is separate the family and pick on that one person to take possession of them. You must stay together as a family, stay strong, keep the love, keep it strong, and also, also must remember, use religious provocation. It does help. And of course, if you've got a rosary and holy water, use that as well.